Homeboy program, and I said, you know what? I really don't know anything about these patients. What am I reading? But regardless, all these patients start showing up in my clinic. I realized that's correctly right. So through today's talk, so oh, actually these are my relevant disclosures. I am a clinical So through today's talk, I want to really focus on three key topics. I want you guys to keep this in mind as it goes through. So how do you guys really understand the difference between light chain or AL amyloid and TTR transthyretin amyloid? I'm going to go over diagnostic pathways in terms of how we make the diagnosis. When do we use imaging? When do we need a tissue specimen? I'm going to spend the remainder of the time talking about the tissue specimen. Okay. So we'll start by looking at a clinical case. We have a 67-year-old woman with fatigue and dyslexia exertion. So she is, sees her primary care doctor who orders an echocardiogram. And what you see is she has significant five inch per hypertrophy by atrial enlargement of her core diffusion, and she also has restricted filling. Based on this, her PCP astutely says, Hey, I'm worthless, sends her to cardiology. Cardiology orders some cardiac biomarkers, which are elevated troponin, and elevated BMP, and does an angiogram, which is negative. Uh, the cardiologist remembers the medical control, hey, maybe this is like an amyloid, and then orders light chains. The kappa is about six, the lambda is 1.5. Normal values for both of these are less than two, and the ratio is elevated at four, and normal ratio is about one. So a cardiologist thinks this patient has light chain amyloid and sends them to oncology. The oncologist does a fat type biopsy, which is negative, and then a femoral biopsy, which shows MGUS for monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. So back to cardiologist, the cardiologist tells her, hey, you know, you don't have amyloid, you have cat type. I want you guys to really think of whether this is accurate. If you saw this patient, would you do any additional testing? Do you think she has amyloid? If she does, what type and how would you treat her? So for the rest of this talk, I want you to keep these questions in mind. Hopefully, I can help address these questions. So what is amyloid? Historically, this came from the Latin word on my mom, Rudolf Burkow, the same Burkow that discovered the Burkow trial. was a really good guy. Um, he really coined the term um, for amyloid in cardiology. So at the time, he was staining this kind of nervous system, and he used an iodine sulfuric acid stain. So he applied this to nerves, However, we know that amyloid is not a switch. It's later determined that it's not a protein. And it's actually not a single protein, but it consists of a lot of different proteins. Essentially, when you have a protein, it outweighs between a folded state, the majority of time, it can extend the and it goes back and forth. When it misfolds, the normal mechanism is your body wants to clear this. It does this by autophagy or via proton degradation. However, when it's unable to clear this, then what ends up happening is your misfolded proteins form these um, beta pleated sheets and ends up depositing in various tissues, and you get the clinical syndrome of amyloid. I want you to take a look at this. There's a lot of different proteins. I'm not expecting anyone to know this or memorize this. The point here is there's a whole bunch of different versions of this body in the body. This is what it looks like when amyloid deposits in the heart. These are pathological specimens. As you see on the top, you get significant um, cardiac deposition in the myocardium. Um, typically, you get levitricular hypertrophy. It's usually concentric, but in many times, the septum is much thicker than the amount of wall, the posterior wall. You get amyloid deposition throughout the endocardium. This includes the atria as well as the ventricles. And because of this, these patients are prone to arrhythmias, conduction abnormalities. They're also highly thrombogenic. In addition, the amyloid can go to the valves, um, causing valvular thickening as well as valvular dysfunction. 
So I talk a lot. put this into an easy to understand um, frame of reference for you. So what is light chain amyloid? So light chain amyloid is caused by plasma cells. If you guys remember from medical school, plasma cells make antibodies. The antibodies were made of heavy and light chains, which consist of kappa and lambda fragments. So what happens when you have a plasma cell abnormality? The plasma cell clones end up taking over a certain percent of the bone marrow. And this produces a clonal antibody as well as excess light chain. So what happens from here? There's three possible outcomes. Outcome number one, there's a small percent of the marrow that's taken over and the light chains do not deposit anywhere. And this is when we get an MGUS. Outcome number two is when the plasma cells take over the percent. And this is when you get multiple myeloma, particularly when you get lytic lesions in your bones. Outcome number three is when the plasma cells take over the is that whether you develop the light chain amyloid is really not how much of the plasma cells you have or how much of the light chains you have, but rather how prone the light chains are to misfolding. So it's possible to have a very small plasma cell population that has significant light chain deposition. And when you get these so in our case, we care mostly about the heart. It causes a restrictive cardiomyopathy but this also goes to kidney causing a nephropathy as well as renal dysfunction. It can go to liver causing hepatic congestion. But it goes to GI tract, these patients will complain of outstanding diarrhea, constipation, and frequently end up having GI bleeds. In clinic, um, most commonly these patients will come in, they complain about soft tissue deposition. They'll have a very enlarged tongue. They'll often have autonomic nervous system involvement, so they'll be, have extreme orthostatic hypotension. They don't tolerate any vasodilators, and they have peripheral nervous system, commonly with hypertension. So if you see a patient like this in clinic, with a sense of restricted cardiomyopathy and close to the other symptoms, then you really want to consider amyloid in your differential. And the other thing is that with light chain amyloid in particular, the mechanism is not purely amyloid deposition. That's been shown in the vitro studies that the light chains themselves were extremely cardiotoxic um, because they cause essentially um, the activate stress kinase pathways and cell death, even in the absence of deposition. So it's possible to have very little amyloid in the heart but have a profound cardiomyopathy. So I talked a bit about light chain amyloid. What's transpyretin amyloid? Transpyretin or TTR is actually a protein that we all make. We commonly refer to this as prealbumin. And we checked this in our patients for nutrition status. I'm sure I'll check this in the last week. Um, normally, it acts as a transfer protein in the body. It's fairly normal. Um, it transports thyroxin at the binding sites that the arrows are pointing to, as well as retinol. And as long as it stays as this nice folded tetramer here, um, it acts the way it should as a transfer protein. However, the problem becomes when it dissociates into a monomer. And this can happen because of the number of the will deposit in various tissues and cause the complication of amyloid. So this diagram might be just a bit of a And the point I want to make here is that you have the TTR pathway on the left and the light chain amyloid on the right, and they're very different processes, right? One comes from the liver, the other comes from the bone marrow. But regardless of this, the endpoint is the same. You end up with these misfolded proteins, you end up seeing restrictive cardiomyopathy in your patients. So what do we think about amyloid? I think this is really um, it's an orphan disease and actually does meet the FDA criteria for being an orphan disease. It uh, has less than 200,000 cases in the United States. And because of this, we think of amyloid typically as a zebra. I'm going to show you over the next several slides. It's probably not as rare as it might seem. How common is this? In the United Kingdom study in 2013, the incidence was about 8 per million. And in the United States, it's about 25 
hundred to 5,000 cases a year for light chain amyloid. The hereditary ATTR prevalence is about 50,000 cases worldwide. So it's probably more common than we think. I mean, it's not something you can see every day, but it's common enough that we're going to see quite a bit of it. From a hereditary ATTR The most common mutations that we see are V30M, T68MV122I. Um, in Portugal, Sweden, and Japan, it's typically V30M, and these patients tend to have almost purely polyneuropathy. Most of these patients will not go on to develop a cardiac phenotype, and this occurs very early. These patients are present in their 30s and 40s. Um, the other mutations include T6CA, which is typically seen in the United Kingdom and Ireland, and these present a bit later in life, typically the 40s and 50s, and it's a mixed phenotype. What about the United States? In the U.S., the most common mutation by far is V122I. Um, because this, the prevalence is about 3 to 4% in all self-identified African-Americans. And there was actually a study looking at the It's again, much more common than we realize. These patients tend to have What about wild-type amyloid? So this is when a tetramer does not have a mutation. It's very common. Historically, there was an autopsy series looking at a consecutive patients who underwent autopsies greater than age 80, and they found that 25% had amyloid deposition. So very, very common. More recently, Mayo Clinic did a study looking at 109 half pef patients compared to age-matched controls. So this is from Maggie Redfield's group. What they found is in the half pef patients, 5% of patients in autopsy have moderate to severe amyloid deposition and 12% of non-amyloid deposition or non-severe amyloid deposition. So these patients in autopsy do not have amyloid deposition. And on the bottom, what you see is as you get older, it's much more common. So it's between the 80s and 90s. So in summary, amyloid probably not. Really want to think about amyloid when you can't explain why they have cancer with a combination of other findings. So I want to move on and talk about diagnosis. So how do we diagnose these patients? So this is a nice diagram from Lori Gertz at Mayo Clinic. Um, in general, when you see these patients in clinic, you see that they have You can get clues from echo images as well as cardiac MRI. And if you're suspicious, then you want to check SPEP, UPEP, and serum free light chains. If the light chains are elevated, then you should always start going to SPEP. But if they're not, that can possibly be a trigger. So this analytic can recommend doing a cardiac biopsy to make the diagnosis. If the light chains are negative, it's very unlikely that this is light chain amyloid. This is one of the very rare cases. In this case, we have a number of options. Typically, we can do either fat pad aspirates, um, or if you want to go the non-invasive approach, then you could do what's called a nuclear technique and pyrophosphate scan. And if either of these are positive, then you probably have severe amyloid. From the sample, again, you can send it for mass spectroscopy to type it, um, but if both are negative, then you should proceed with a cardiac biopsy to make the diagnosis. So what are the imaging findings that make us suspicious? So these are as well as a pericardial effusion. If you look at diastology on the bottom left, what you see are these patients are not consistent with the exam, not consistent with, strict, with restricted filling pattern, and they have very low tissue Doppler indices with a high E2E prime. Probably more so the surface imaging that we use to do the serology is looking at global longitudinal strain. And on the left, this is a normal pattern. What we'd like to see is this nice red heterogeneous pattern. Um, and a normal value is more negative than minus 18. So this is normal at minus 23%. On the right, we have a patient with amyloid. So the gold launch strain is going to be reduced. 
This is about negative 5%. And what we see is a bullseye pattern. We have essentially apical spurring. Where the apex is and what we see is that in we we have What about cardiac MRI? So I know pre run loss they love MRI so to include this. But the patterns that we see tend to be late gadolinium enhancements. Um, classically, what you see is some in the cortical enhancement diffusely because this is kind of a diffuse process. Um, and then you can see this where the arrows are pointing that it's going to be kind of everywhere, right? Because this is on um, the systemic process. Um, but in addition to this pattern, you can also get essentially a patchy pattern throughout the myocardium, or sometimes you can also get transmural involvements. Another thing that we like to look at is something called gadolinium kinetics. So of patients, with less than a more gadolinium than your heart tissue. So the blood should melt or turn black before your heart tissue. And you can see in a normal patient, the blood should melt before the heart tissue. And in case of thyroid, however, because you have so much amyloid deposition and extra cell in the heart tissue, the heart tissue should actually feel better. Because everywhere, it's everywhere. So the heart will feel much mellower and turn black before um, the blood flow does. And this is very specific for cardiac amyloid, more specific than the OGE pattern. So this is an example of what looks like a real clinic. If you look at it, it looks like a real clinic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What about nuclear imaging? You guys know I spent some time in the nuclear lab. Um, the study that's very helpful for amyloid from a nuclear perspective is going to be the pyrophosphate scans. So what this is, it's a very old bone tracer. And the, in Europe, they use DPD. In the United States, we use pyrophosphates. For whatever reason, this is bound by TTR, but not by light chain amyloid. So it's very useful in differentiating between these two types of amyloid. On the left, we see a patient with TTR amyloid with uptake in the heart. And then in the middle, the light chain patient does not have any uptake. So Matt Maurer's group at Columbia basically looked at this and showed that a ratio looking at the heart compared to contralateral lung in terms of uptake of this tracer, if it's greater than 1.5, um, it's fairly sensitive and specific for the key term amyloid. However, I caution you using the scan. You want to combine this with a diagnostic antibody because when you're near this threshold, you can't really be certain what's going on, right? The other thing that should be kept in mind is if it's a positive scan, it's probably the TTR. However, if it's a negative scan, you don't know whether it's because you have light chain amyloid or you might not have any amyloid at all because you just don't update the tracer. I talked a bit about fat pad aspiration. I don't know how many of you have one of these on your patients, but the sensitivity is highly variable. When I looked at the literature, you know, the sensitivity, the sensitivity appeared to range from 20% all the way to 80%. So highly variable. So a study from the UK tried to look at this in more detail. And what they showed is the reason why you see such wide variability in the literature is because the different types of amyloid actually have different sensitivities. Light chain amyloid, you're likely to find it. Uh, hereditary ATTR, maybe. A wild type amyloid, probably not. So um, fat pad biopsy is not the most accurate testing. So in our patients, I always select the gold standard. This is a classic Congo red pattern where you see a pink amorphous material throughout the myocardium. On the middle, what you see is if you stick this under polarized light, and you probably remember this from medical school, but you get this nice apple green birefringence. And this is extremely classic for cardiac amyloid. There are a number of other stains available, and I put them here, but they're less commonly used. You might ask, what about typing amyloid? Mayo Clinic by Kelly Smith and the Pathology Department. Here's a final table. So I want to move on now from diagnosis and talk um, about therapy for the remainder of the time. 
So what do we do when we see these patients in clinic? How do we treat them? You know, I think classically we think, why do we care? We can't treat animals. And you want to have their symptoms the way you usually do. Do you want to give them loop diuretics and still will last them? What about traditional heart symptoms? Yeah. These neurohormone blockade therapies are actually not effective and tend to make these patients worse. With our late patients, the classic teaching is a heart muscle. So, in fact, in these patients, we actually tend to give them midodrin to combat this postural hypotension caused by their autonomic neuropathy. These patients were highly However, in these patients, the rate's much higher. So you should automatically put them on anticoagulation regardless of what the rest of the These patients are also very prone to ventricular arrhythmias, and you might want to also do them. And in general, you always want to treat the underlying disease process. So for these patients, you have to Um, so what's the data on ICDs? So this is what we always hear, right? ICDs are like phenomenal. Um, and you know, this is data from the Mayo Clinic from Grace Lynn, uh, which included about 53 patients in the early 2000s. When they implanted their patients with um, ICDs, about 32% of patients have appropriate shocks, more light chain patients than TTR patients. However, what they saw is they you know these So more recently, Ron Mutellis and the Stanford group did look to retrospect their data. And thank you for the research. Initially, they looked at the patients who were in the initial monitor. These patients, about 74% of them had non sustained VT. 19 of them underwent ICD implantation. And what they found was about 80% of them had non sustained VT. This is the algorithm that they have proposed at Stanford. Essentially, if you have a patient who is not a survivor, you should consider an alternative to the algorithm that they have I'm going to move on and talk about specific therapies. So, you know, So there's a lot of 
chemotherapy regimens that are being developed to really try to reduce the presence of the population. Oncologists are very successful at this. Most of these regimens are successful. And in general, in the last few years, they've been successful. Because they have the Have the early 2000s. So, not that long ago, but even two decades ago, or less than two decades ago, what we saw is survival for all comers. Mm -hmm. survival in all comers is now more than four years. That's continuing to improve. And there was Tumumab, which is a CD30 targeted muscle antibody against plasma cells. Again, this is adapted from the myeloma literature. This is data from the Stanford group looking at 25 patients that were tumor refractors, conventional chemotherapy. So even though these patients were did not respond to chemotherapy, they were eligible for Tumumab. And the reason for Tumumab, there was a study from the and this was the other one. Complete regression of the amyloid. So this is a very effective therapy, and there's even some discussion about perhaps using this first line to avoid the processes associated with chemotherapy. What about directly removing the positive chemotherapy? There's a one slide called Neo D001 from Porthena. And this is phase two data on the right that essentially shows that with this antibody, you get a reduction in T4 BMP, a reduction in proteinuria. So phase three of this just recently completed. This was a vital study. And the So this is a summary slide for how we're able to treat light chain amyloid. As you can see, there's a lot of chemotherapies and antibodies that are being developed to target the plasma cells, as well as antibodies being developed to really target amyloid. So I talked already about NeoD001. So what is this other antibody? Quite a mouthful. And what this is, is it's a regimen being developed in, in the United Kingdom. So what they do is they give these patients with light chain amyloid So how do we treat this? If you remember from earlier, TTR is made by the liver. Okay, you have this nice tetrameric protein as that basically dissociates into monomers, and this falls into the cell membrane tissue. So Remove what's already in your tissue. So, what about liver transplant? The reason why it's mostly used in B30M is the majority. 
But other mutations, the problem is mostly patients. And what a lot of programs are doing is testing those domino transplants. So you take a healthy liver, give it to the patient with mutation, and then give that liver to another patient. So it's not that it takes a very long time to do a whole thing. And what you see is that the survival is actually pretty good um, for patients who get liver transplants. You know, the blue curve are patients who have early onset V30M, TTR, and the survival curve actually runs off the page, which is 15 years. So these patients live almost a normal life if they get a liver transplant. What about RNA interference? There's a lot of interest in this. So there's you know, more and more technologies being developed. I think some of the earliest um, attempts have been with teacher amyloid, which is what makes this case. Um, so Um, science and complex or the risk complex. Once it attaches to this, it goes up, downstream to really attach to messenger RNA that cleaves the messenger RNA. And how do you deliver this, right? Because you have to target this. Nanoparticle, which is intrinsically accumulated in the liver, and essentially these RNAs are released and they attach to your risk complexes in the liver. In addition, the other method is with both processes, the idea is you can get the SNRA directly to the liver. So you can have a production. Ruseran. This was a silencing RNA compound looking at patients with hereditary ATTR cardiomyopathy. We were actually one of the sites for this. And with this drug, they found a significant knockdown, about 90% TTR knockdown. And the treatment arm died compared to only 3% in the placebo arm. When the curve went back and looked at this specifically, it turns out there were no difference in cardiovascular hospitalizations, no difference in TTR knockdown, no difference in lactate. And when they looked at this histologically, there was really no difference in the At least that's sort of going thought, but regardless, this drug is not being developed. The same company developed another Currently being um, revealed by the FDA. For Partisaran, they also increased the. It's very promising, exciting um, for someone who sees these patients because for their cardiac sub um, endpoints, what they found is there was a reduction in T4 BMP, there was a reduction in the LV wall thickness. There was improvement in the longitudinal strain, and there was improvement in the 10-minute gait speed. Um, because of this, currently, when it's undergoing FDA approval, we're actually looking for approval. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Another drug that also acts with RNA silencing is inotersin. So this was developed by Ionis TTR. You might know them as ISIS. You know, this was the original name, but they changed the name because they realized that was probably a bad idea to have a company called ISIS. Um, so this drug was studied in the neuro um, So it acts downstream from siRNA. Um, similarly, they looked at neurologic endpoints because the study involved patients with polyneuropathy. And what they also found is that they give patients This company wanted to look at this drug in cardiomyopathy, and we were supposed to be one of the sites. The Braxel Smith Klein was going to work with IONIS for this. However, because of some safety concerns, What about TTR stabilization? I mentioned, you know, in addition to knockdown, you could try to prevent the system. And this is data in patients with polyneuropathy. So what this is, is it binds to the um, thyroxine binding sites and prevents the tetramer from dissociating. The primary endpoint for this was also in the neurologic scale. And, you know, I think the study design was a bit flawed. got treated with the drug to the end of the study, there was a significant benefit for the reduction in neuropathy. And based on this, this drug has been approved in the summary for ATTR, you could target a number of different pathways. You could try to reduce TTR production by doing a liver transplant. If this doesn't work, you could do gene silencing. You could try to stabilize the TTR tetramer. So diflunosol is another compound. I didn't really talk much about this, but you can actually get this on the market already. What this is, is it's an NSAID. The there have been small studies looking at this in neuropathy patients, really effective. From a cardiac perspective, however, I never use it. Sorry, tefamidus is actually very similar to diflunosol. The difference is that tefamidus is much more specific, so you don't have the side effects of diflunosol. There's other compounds coming out in upcoming trials, which includes AG10. This was developed at Stanford, and the difference is there's much higher binding affinity for the thyroxine binding site compared to these other drugs. And talcapone is also being studied. This is a drug that's What about removing the amyloid deposits? There's some weak data that doxycycline and green tea extract can actually remove amyloid deposits by disrupting the amyloid and these are the weak data. Um, so the In addition, the antibodies being developed to leach the amyloid out of the tissues sort of align with the same antibody. What about heart transplants? I'm a transplant cardiologist, right? You know, well, what about most of the heart transplants? During our selection committee, I look around the room. This is kind of you know, they're very sick. They're not going to do well. However, if you look at the new data, it is a positive trend. an old era compared to the current era of 108 patients. So in the older era, in the 80s, 2007, what you see is these amyloid patients did not do well. Median survival was only about five years on the left for amyloid patients, and it is significantly worse than non amyloid patients. However, the lower data, we think it's For 
patients, um, if you look at the median survival, median survival extends um, actually beyond where this goes, but these patients survive about as well as non-amyloid patients. So it's a very viable strategy to transplant amyloid patients as long as you carefully select them. I think the problem with transplanting amyloid patients is how do you bridge them to transplant? Now these very sick patients, how do you get them there? This is data from Mark Semigram at MGH before he left MGH, but they looked at 31 patients with light chain amyloid, and what they found is only 18 survived to transplant. I think this is very alarming, right? The red curve or the amyloid patients, it goes almost straight down. So it's very hard to get these patients to survive to transplant. You're gonna have very high weightless mortality. I think that's the majority problem. But if these patients make it to transplant, um, how do they do? So this is data from Mayo Clinic looking at light chain amyloid patients. And what they found is patients who achieve remission do very well. Median survival is about 11 years. For patients who don't achieve remission from a hematologic standpoint, they do very poorly only surviving about two years. So th the emphasis here is really, if your patient achieves remission from a hematologic standpoint, then you can consider them for heart transplant. So what happened to a patient that we started with in clinic? I sent the sample for my spectroscopy, which confirmed the v one 2 2 i mutation. So she has TTR amyloid. which is no progression of disease, and our hemodynamics are essentially normal. So I want you guys to take these points home. So the key factors for myocardial infarction, the main factors for myocardial Non-invasive diagnosis is possible, but this is only if your FFG testing is true. So the normal is the We have emerging very effective therapies for both light chain amyloid as well as TTR amyloid. As you saw, there's a lot coming down the pipeline. A lot of them are in phase two and three, but they're going to be commercially available soon. Heart transplant is a viable option. We have developed an amyloid program. So this has been a multi-disciplinary um, program in conjunction with very successful support group. We were actually recently designated the Center of Excellence for Amyloid. I thank you very much for your